Uh, so today we have uh, Oliver Benson. He's a professor from Humboldt University in Berlin. And he's going to talk to us about DX centers in diamond. It's a, a, uh, a defect in diamond and quantum applications of this uh, DX center. So uh, Oliver <coughs> is undergraduate degree from LMU in Munich and his PhD from LMU and the Max Planck Institute at Garching, which is nearby. And uh, afterwards came to Stanford University in the United States. He worked on micromasers there and switched to solid state physics and has been doing that ever since. Spent two years at Stanford, went to University of Constance, and has been a professor at Humboldt since 2001, I think, right? 2001? And uh, so, go ahead, Hyper. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, thank you, Glenn, very much. And uh, thank you also very much for the invitation to this seminar. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'm looking forward for lab tours and uh, further discussions this afternoon. As mentioned, um, today I would like to present uh, some research that we are doing on defect centers, so a specific emitter in the solid state. And uh, as mentioned already, I think I'm more from quantum optics background, so working with atoms. And often I will regard this uh, intrinsically semiconductor system as an atomic-like system. OK, the motivation uh, for our work in principle relies on uh, using fundamental emitters and trying to establish fundamental nanophotonic elements. And fundamental means we use single photons that we convert, route, shuffle around, send around, detect, generate, and so forth. The uh, ingredients that we use as kind of single sources, single photon sources, so fundamental light sources, are depicted here in this cartoon. So uh, smaller system that we uh, employ are typically molecules. We use also quantum dots, so semiconductor structures. And uh, also, as mentioned, and as was also the title, it's also the title of the talk, defect centers in diamond. So this is the, the active part of the so-called devices or fundamental devices. Then on the other side, we have photonic or plasmonic structures. And the reason is that single emitter is not a very bright light source, and the interaction of this single quantum system with the electromagnetic field has to be enhanced or would be advantageous to enhance the interaction. And to have this interaction enhancement, we put these uh, fundamental emitters in resonant dielectric structures or also in plasmonic structures. And here you can see some of the systems that we are fabricating and studying. So it starts with some uh, optical microresonators silicon silicon system. We uh, fabricate also photonic crystal structures, so thin membrane in transparent uh, materials and defects, I think, so light confinement in these structures to enhance the interaction. And also, this is not a plasmonic structure, it's a gold antenna, and also there in the gap, the electromagnetic field can be dramatically enhanced. So I mentioned uh, this could be regarded as some building blocks for fundamental devices. But on the other hand, it's typically a single quantum system interacting with a local, possibly modified environment. So that's also interesting physics to see how a quantum system interacts with its local environment or how few quantum systems interact with each other. And uh, typically on this very small scales, nanoscales, also this environment cannot be treated as a simple reservoir. So the peculiar interaction on the local scale uh, is that what interests us. OK, this is the idea uh, of the talk today. Uh, as mentioned, um, I would like to concentrate today on diamond defect centers as a video. So I will spend a few slides to introduce this system to you. Then uh, I have one part that refers to a new approach for making uh, nanophotonic structures, as mentioned, to enhance light matter interaction with them. Um, I will discuss the peculiar effect of spectral diffusion in the solid state emitters. And uh, finally, I will also show you some application of how these single quantum emitters can also be used in sensing applications as scanning probes. OK, let's start with uh, diamond nanophotonics. 
Uh, maybe that you have heard already some talks about diamond nanophotonics. This is uh, maybe a slide that you see very often. It's a kind of must-show slide if you talk about diamond photonics. You see these diamonds, and uh, as you know, some of them are not simply transparent. They, they come with nice, bright colors. So reddish, or bluish, or pinkish, and so forth. And this color comes from defects. And uh, that you see a color already shows that some quantum effect is going on. You see some spectral lines on these defects that produce the color. Um, you also, once you buy such a, a diamond, you can look at it forever. I think it always has this pinkish color or bluish color, so there's no bleaching and so forth. This is also good news. I think if you take a look at a single of these defect centers, you have optical stability, and you see this at room temperature. Yeah. So it's a room temperature, quantum system, and it's optically stable, and that makes it very attractive to study fundamental uh, effects with it. Uh, recently, a uh, major impact also on the field of diamond nanophotonics came from the material side. So, uh, material is available in very high quality. It's available naturally. You can buy natural diamonds. But you can also grow CBD films of very high quality. And the system that we're using is uh, diamond in nanocrystalline form. You can grind down uh, ultra pure diamond or you can. Uh, have some explosion reactors that produce this nano diamonds. So these little fragments, uh, these are large guy here. These little fragments are also these diamonds that occur in grinding powder or in nail files. I think you have this diamond powder there as well. So it's a material that's easily available uh, to you. And we should think of them all as having facets like that one? Pardon? They should all have facets like that one? Um, no, I think typically this is a rather big one. Typically you see the crystal structure when you grind it down. Often the shape is rather irregular. Mm -hmm. So also the grinding powder that you buy, if you will take a look at small uh, nano diamonds, some of them can be needle-like, but you see the facets, obviously it's a crystal. Okay, um, that's one of these uh, defect centers. It's, it's the so-called nitrogen vacancy defect center. It has most widely been studied, so a lot of things are known about it. It consists of well, it's carbon lattice, carbon diamond lattice, and here you have one carbon atom missing, and next to it you have a nitrogen atom here. So uh, you have four neighbors here, carbon atoms. Uh, nitrogen gives an, electrical, an additional electron, and this defect can also be charged. So in fact, you have a confining potential here where you can trap six electrons, it's like a six electron atom, so to say. You can excite this by shining in green light, 532 nanometers, and then you can observe the spectrum that comes out of such a defect. And you see it's rather broad, this room temperature spectrum. You see a pronounced zero phonon line, come back to this later. Um, if you cool it down here for two Kelvin, uh, it still has a broad uh, emission spectrum, but you see it more pronounced here, the zero phonon line, so an optical transition where there are no vibrations involved. Okay, and this you can see forever, so it's optically stable forever, even on the single defect center level. This is a simplified version of the energy level diagram. You have a ground state and an excited state, and uh, it's a triplet ground state and a triplet excited state. Come back to this on the next slide. For us, for the optical properties, um, optical transitions matter. And as mentioned, I think you can excite them. This is not correct. I think this arrow should go up. You can excite it off resonance with green laser. You have relaxation processes that bring the excitation to the excited state. And then after some time, uh, some 10 nanoseconds or so, you have a decay, spontaneous decay, and that gives you a single photon. So in that sense, it's a, a straightforward single photon source that provides you a photon emitting in the red, red spectral range. There are also some immediate stage uh, uh, states here, and uh, sometimes the excitation can uh, escape this way, go back this way, and this leads to some blinking. So in fact, it's a single photon source that goes off sometimes, and you will see this later, the effect of this uh, interrupted emission in the correlation that I show you later on. Um, these are optical properties, as mentioned. I think this way you can make a fundamental light source. You isolate one of these defects. Yeah, I think they are not so dense. I think you can isolate one in optical microscope and excite it and collect the photons from only one of these defect centers. Um, just 
Um, a remark, I don't want to talk about the spin physics of the system, but this is a major uh, advantage of this specific NB center. As said, it has a triplet ground state, so it's in a sense like an atom where you have different hyperfine states available in the ground state. And this is very interesting for spin manipulation. Uh, I only want to, to mention one uh, property here. You can use this to detect magnetic fields. And uh, this is the idea. I think, again, this is the, the uh, energy level uh, diagram of the MV center. You have a split ground state, split excited state, and some intermediate state. And if you excite these states here, I think uh, in this case resonantly with 637 nanometers or so, you can have spontaneous emission. And this spontaneous emission is typically uh, spin state preserving. And uh, you can see, I think, these intersystem crossings, so from the triplet system to the singlet system, spin selective. Yeah. So if you excite the system, say broadband, or if you have the excitation distributed over these excited states, only these states here decay via this intermediate state, and they are trapped here for some hundred nanoseconds. That means if you start here, you go up, it goes back, you see a bright state, you see light coming out all the time. If you start here, there's a 50% chance that you make a crossing to this uh, intermediate state here, and then the excitation is trapped here for some time, and then it comes back finally. So this is a dark state. And you can see if you just continuously excite it, say, above resonance here, you can also perform some optical pumping, so you pump all the excitation in the specific <coughs> MS equals zero state. Um, if you take a look at this, yeah, uh, you can see a different fluorescence depending on whether you start here or here, and this gives you the possibility to read out the spin state optically. And uh, this is shown here, this is just the measured fluorescence. Yeah? When you start with the system in the MS equals zero state or on the MS equals one state, so the red curve is if you start here, yeah, you excite it, you see fluorescence right away, and then it decays to some intermediate value. If you start in this state here, there's a blue curve. In principle, it's kind of a dark state, so only 50% of the cases you come in back, see a photon, 50% of the cases you go over here. You see a reduced fluorescence, and if you go on and on, uh, sometimes, for some time, you reach into the kind of uh, average state here, but you see this uh, time scale, some 100 nanoseconds, you can tell from the difference of the fluorescence in which state you started. And then you can shine in microwave transitions and so on and read out the state optically. And if you have this state, then you can also use it to couple it to a magnetic field. You can see how the spin rotates and you can use this, use this to perform optically detecting magnetic resonance. So is that looking at just a single uh, the question is, is that looking just as a single uh, defect? Yes, it's, you can do this uh, looking at a single defect. So you can use this defect center also as a probe. Uh, and that's very important to probe magnetic fields. I'll come back to this maybe later in the outlook, but not during this talk. Okay, as mentioned, um, in this talk we're interested in the kind of optical cycle, so we're just taking a look at the light that's coming out of this defect center. We start with nano crystalline diamond, so we buy the nanocrystalline diamond commercially, it comes in aqua solution, we can spin coat it on a glass cover slide, that's typically how we start, so uh, here it's a dispersed solution of uh, diamond fragments with a diameter between 40 and 90 nanometers or so, and some of them naturally contain these NB defect centers. And we would like to find out one of these fragments that contains only a single defect center. And we do this by measure fluorescence. And uh, okay, shine green light on the sample. Some of these nanocrystals emit red light. And then we collect the red light and send it to a uh, Hunter Brown twist setup. So we just correlate the intensity. You know, we just correlate. We select the fluorescence coming out here. We send it to a beam splitter. Uh, half of it goes up, half of it goes down, and we measure a photon <coughs> correlation. And by doing this, uh, we can determine the uh, normalized autocorrelation function, and this gives you a number for the uh, number of defect centers in this very uh, nanocrystal. So this is the theoretical curve here, the red line, and uh, you know, I think this normalized autocorrelation function uh, can easily describe time zero for a clock state, it's just one minus one over n, 
where n is the number of independent emitters. So you have a single photon source, this is zero, and that means for a single photon source, not too surprising if you send it to a beam splitter, these two detectors will never click at a time. And this gives you a means, I think, to experimentally find out how many defect centers are in a specific nanodiamond here. You don't know this a priori. So uh, this is done, so we select out one of these guys, in this case this one here, that has such a autocorrelation function, uh, it's limited in time resolution, so it doesn't go down uh, exactly to zero, but we know then that this nano diamond contains only a single NV center. That's room temperature measurement, uh, everything is stable forever, and uh, it's rather large, some 10 nanometers, so we can move this thing around. So we regard this sometimes as a kind of movable atom. So you can just put it wherever you want to have it. That's actually what we do. We developed a kind of um, pick and place technique by using scanning probes. We have a commercial AFM, and we have a setup where we have a confocal microscope to measure photocorrelations, the fluorescence, and on top of it, we have a coarse <coughs> microscope. And we can use this to pick up these movable atoms. Um, again, we start with such a random distribution of this nano diamond. We select out a specific one that has only a single defect center. So it's done on a confocal microscope. It's just sketched here by the microscope objective from below. Then we come from the top with an AFM probe. We can measure the topography and we can find out the nano diamond emitted single photons here. And you can see here we observe continuously some fluorescence from the nano diamond. When we come close with the tip, you know, we can uh, put it directly on top of the nano diamond, then some additional fluorescence is scattered into the microscope objective. So we have more light, even more light that we detect here by the microscope objective. And then we bring down the tip, and due to surface adhesion, you know, um, just some whatever water layers on the tip and so forth, uh, it's possible to pick up this nano diamond. In this case, you can see that we come close, we pick it up, and then the fluorescence drops to the background level. That's a question. Yeah. These nano diamonds, uh, they, they are, are they made up from a powder, or is, is it grinded? Uh, yeah, in this case, some of them come from explosion reactors. So you put a lot of graphite in a reactor with some TNT, you explode it. And then you have, uh, without exploding the reactor, of course, and uh, then you have a high pressure, and then you have a lot of still graphite around the, the uh, diamond and you have to clean it, you have to etch off the graphite. In the end you can buy it commercially, so there are some companies that also sell you some pre-selected samples. As mentioned, there's some size distribution, so you don't want to start with a kind of ultra broad distribution. So that's commercially available. Yeah. But it's not, it's not an ultra clean material, that's maybe also something to mention here. But it's commercially available here. It's not from grinding powder, so it's a little bit more refined, cleaned samples, but it's commercially available. Okay. Okay, once we have a diamond here, and uh, I mentioned we just attached it due to surface adhesion or so forth, we can uh, remove the reservoir here, and we can put on top of the confocal microscope any other structure, and we can then revert this process. We just touch down the AFM tip a few times. And sometimes I think, uh, or we wait as long until we deposited this uh, single nanocrystal here. And then we know that we have deposited a particle that contains only a single and a single layer. Two examples um, what kind of structures we could uh, functionalize in this way. So, this is the end facet of an optical fiber, it's a photonic crystal fiber. And uh, if you zoom in, you see, I think it's an AFM image here. You can maybe you can see this thing up here. That's a small fragment of a nano diamond, maybe also 40 nanometers in diameter, and we know it contains only a single defect center. So if we shine light on it from one side, on the other side of the fiber, on the other side of the fiber, single photons are coming out. Um, you can also bring it in a resonant structure. So this is a photonic crystal structure with a defect. So light is tightly confined here, and you can bring this uh, nano diamond with a single defect center. And this resembles a typical cavity QED system. You have a single emitter and a cavity interacting with each other. And the pronounced effect that you see is that you have an enhancement here. In this case, we enhance the zero fold of line image. Yes, there was a question. What's the probability of finding a, a little speck with one defect? 
the probability to find um, a nano diamond with a single uh, NB center is here for this size distribution and for this natural distribution here of defects in about a little bit less than 10% of this nano diamonds that we have there um, are is a single uh, NB center. We see only the ones that fluorescence that, that uh, have some fluorescence and then we perform some correlation measurements and we single out one. So that's why it's also important to have stability because this takes some time, but you can take well as long as you want to select out one and then select it. Okay, another uh, functionalization. This this is one um, antenna structure. You can bring the noun diamond here. Uh, this one and the same antenna. We just repeat the experiment, so you can put it here. You can move it around a little bit. You can move it here, move it here, move it here. So you can also put this noun diamond wherever you want to have it. Okay, so that's uh, the toolbox that we have. Um, you can also uh, put it on the end of a so solid immersion lens, so that collects a lot of photons. And as mentioned, just to advertise the simplicity of the system, microphone <coughs> objectives, excitation lasers, filtering, and so forth, you can put everything in a small box, and this gives you that a kind of single photon source at room temperature uh, that you may want to buy it sometime in the future. So the typical rates, um, this is why I have this slide, the typical rates of photons that are coming out is here one million photons per second in this configuration. So we have this winter temperature source, one million photons per second coming out, distributed over this rather broad spectrum now. Okay, um, I showed you some, um, or one approach that we use to functionalize like plasmonic or dielectric structures with single ND centers. However, for some applications, this is, takes too long. It's uh, cost, intensive, cost intensive and so forth. So we thought about recently to uh, develop another method how to fabricate these nanophotonic elements uh, and NV centers in diamond. And uh, this is the, the idea here um, that we developed recently. I think we use direct laser writing. Uh, you may have heard about this, so, and, or you may have seen this uh, little figure here, this bull. Uh, the idea is to make the structures by two photon absorption <coughs> and two photon polymerization in a kind of resist on the polymer. So the idea is you just focus in light and only at the focal spot where the polymerization is induced and then you can develop the structure and by scanning around the focus in 3D you can write almost any arbitrary structure in this resist on this polymer. And uh, this is bull. Um, nice thing. Uh, this is a photonic structure uh, from uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. I think you can see from the back. Uh, it has some very fine grid structure here. So it's also a photonic crystal or a metamaterial structure. So very fine structures in three dimensions. So this is well known. Also commercial uh, systems are available to perform these writing and uh, these kind of developing of these 3D structures. And we got interested in functionalizing these structures with single emitters, quantum emitters. And the naive approach uh, worked surprisingly. So we just uh, took a solution of these nano diamonds. So again, to mention some 10 nanometers in diameter. We mixed it with a polymer. We produced a layer of this resist. And then we used type laser writing. These particles induce some scattering, so we were a little bit worried that this uh, may disturb the process, but obviously it did not disturb the process so much. So this again is schematics of the approach. <coughs> we focus in a laser, we move around the laser focus, computer controlled, and then we develop the structure. And this is just a test structure. You can see we have these uh, little mushrooms here, so they resemble some disk resonators, so light can be trapped in them in circles around here in some whispering gallery mode type of things. We can couple a three-dimensional waveguide to it here. Now we can make two resonators. This is a kind of beam splitter, so these two waveguides come close to each other and so forth. So first of all, there seems to be no limitation, I think, to make any kind of structure. So what about the diamonds? Uh, what are the scales yeah. over on this right-hand side? Pardon? Uh, I didn't see a scale on the right-hand ah, side. Ah, um, this is a little small. This is... <coughs> oh, there it is. I have to put those, okay. I think, two microns, I think. Couple of microns. Yeah, a couple of microns. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the limit here for this procedure, you can also use modern microscopy techniques like STET, is uh, something like 80 nanometer structures if you send in 800 nanometer light. Okay, first characterization of these Resonators, as mentioned, we like to have resonators to enhance the interaction of single quantum emitters with modes of the electromagnetic field. 
And uh, this is just a sample with some discs, 20 micrometer in diameter. You can couple light to them and measure light coming out by coupling an optical fiber taper. And this just shows you the typical spectrum of such a resonator when compared to the diameter. Everything works well. Q factor is not uh, extremely large, 10 to 4 here, but it can be improved by reflow processes that's already developed in these uh, plastic structures. Okay, um, where are the nano diamonds? So these are next experiments. So uh, we fabricated such a structure with uh, distribution of nano diamonds uh, randomly. And we did some scan. So we sent in a green excitation laser and scanned it over this three-dimensional structure. And we had two detectors, one here, one here, that collected red light, so fluorescence light from nano diamonds. And this is a scanning image, yeah? So again, you scan the laser over this 3D structure. Um, when you hit the uh, waveguide right away, I think some light is coupled here. But uh, you can see if you scan across this uh, uh, resonator, you couple in some light if you hit the rim here. But you can see this localized spot here also shows some fluorescence. And this is actually uh, a nano diamond yeah, that uh, has defect centers in it. And the light that you see here is mentioned again. I think you focus the excitation laser here, but this uh, signal here is collected here and here. Oh. Yeah. Was the nano, the nano diamond positioned there by you? No, or it just happened to be uh, yeah. lucky? Or? In the first step, I think it's just luck. I think we just uh, distributed, I think, these nano diamonds in the resist. We wrote this structure yeah. by chance. And then we were scanning. You can see here's another one. Okay. We're just scanning the structure, and you, you see a few of these nano, nano diamonds distributed here by chance. And this one we, we analyzed, yeah, it's uh, already some kind of hundred bound twist configuration. You can make a correlation between light coming out here and here. You see it's anti-bunched, uh, does not go to zero, it's just an error here. You can see also from this anti-bunching curve that obviously you have here a single nano diamond uh, that emits single photons in this kind of three-dimensional structure. Okay, next step, that was the question uh, already. Next step would be to make this on demand. Uh, we're just developing now a process where you start with a dilute distribution of these nano diamonds and then first find out where they are in 3D. And then interconnect this by these photonic structures. And that's in a sense an extension of an approach that has been used with quantum dots. Quantum dots are on layers and also often randomly distributed. And that's also an approach to make a solid structure, solid state structure to look where they are and make a structure around it. Here there's a possibility to make a two three-dimensional structure and we think this would be very attractive to interconnect uh, different uh, NV centers with these three-dimensional structures. What can you do with it? Um, you can improve single photon collection. You can make a single photon source in plastic, in a sense. Now, for example, you can, can write a polymer structure and coat it with metal. So this could be a hemisphere or a para parabolic mirror or a Weierstrass <coughs> geometry. So any kind of structure that collects light better can be written uh, in a straightforward way in this plastic structure. Uh, another thing we are thinking about, uh, I mentioned this magnetic sensing using the nano diamonds only very briefly, but uh, there's an experiment from a um, group in Stuttgart and uh, Melbourne. They showed that on top of a diamond, you can kind of see much here, that's a diamond layer, diamond membrane here. You grew a cell on it, an axon, axon uh, nerve cell actually, and they use some of the nano diamonds in here to measure locally the magnetic fields. And it has been shown that uh, you can also make from these polymer structures three dimensional scaffolds where these cells like to grow on. And you can think about making also these 3D structures um, grow some stuff on it, cells on it, biocompatible, biocompatible environment, and you still have the option, I think, to measure locally the magnetic field. So that's some of the extension that we have in mind for this approach. Uh, kind of cheap photo collection, collecting structures on one hand and possibly some also cheap uh, sensing structures on the other hand made out of plastic. Okay, uh, I come to, to a next um, topic and that goes back a little bit to, to the motivation I showed you here. Um, the application of these single quantum systems for quantum information processing and so forth. Um, this is a nice cartoon uh, artist view of such a device, I think. Um, the idea is you, you have two diamonds, 
Now diamonds that contain a single quantum system, single photon emitter. You collect the photons, you know, you're excited to reunite, you collect the photons in this kind of integrated dielectric structure, and you have a beam splitter here. And the beam splitter is the nonlinear element, in a sense, together with the detection, uh, to make a photon photon interaction. Yeah? So it's just this two photon interference effect. You know, this two bosons, 50 50 beam splitter, bosons like to stick together, so the two photons would come out here or here. That's a kind of basic effect that relies on proposals to make quantum logic with photons. So linear optical quantum information processing. Um, that's first functionality that you would like to show, that you have the possibility to collide two photons and beam splitter and see this two photon interference effect. It's easy to draw this, but uh, as any emitter in the solid state, these and these centers are not identical. Yeah. They see a slightly different environment, and so typically the photons that they emit are not identical. In order to have this effect, you need identical photons. So we looked a little bit deeper in the quality of photons that are coming out here, in terms of finding out how identical are the photons that are emitted from the MB centers in nanocrystalline light. Um, first of all, we can take a look again at this room temperature fluorescence spectrum. It's rather broad, and you see how they can see here the zero phonal line. You can cool it down. It looks better. Uh, you see a peak here, but you have to compare the area under the peak, of course. Yeah. This area is rather tiny compared to this one. You can use means of enhancement of the emission here to enhance emission by a factor of 10, or maybe 4, maybe more. Uh, so in principle, this would be OK. But if you look closer, even at this seemingly narrow line, you can see that it's also a broad line. So it's not limited by the lifetime. And this would be required to have identical photons. You need photons that are just limited in their width by the lifetime. This is not the case. And you can see why. If you take a spectrum, and uh, I don't know how fast this is, but you have something like 10 uh, counts per, millis per 30 milliseconds. So in uh, a second, you have three times as much, so 30 counts or something like this. Uh, so it's a few second scan. You can hardly see the zero phone line anymore, but you can see it's jittering back and forth. Huh? And uh, that's a toy model uh, for maybe a solid state system and an emitter inside. You create a fluctuating electromagnetic electrostatic environment typically. Also by this excitation process with a laser, you induce carriers, and they are close to the ND center, and they shift around the line due to Stark effect. And unfortunately, you can see, I think this jitter is quite fast, and uh, we were looking for a method to measure this frequency jitter, the spectral distribution, on a faster time scale. The number of photons that are coming out here is 100,000 photons per second, maybe less than that. The question is, how can you look at the spectrum faster than a few seconds? Yeah, you can see already something happened. Something happens in a few seconds. Okay, we um, um, used a method um, that again used photon correlation, and uh, we use a uh, approach that translates the spectral jitter in an intensity jitter. It's kind of easy to understand. If you send light to an interferometer, and uh, here you have an interferometer, and the interferometer has two outputs, yeah, then the intensity in one output or the other depends on everything static on the wavelength. If you shift the wavelength around, the light is coming out on the one output or on the other output. And this way you can understand if you have a fluctuating line, and you can see the spectral fluctuations in an intensity fluctuation in the end in the two output ports. And this is the idea uh, of this approach. So you can do the math, and uh, you can do the following. You can measure the autocorrelation of the light from such a single emitter. Now it's just the ordinary G2 function. Then you can compare it to an autocorrelation function between the two output ports of an interferometer you put in between. And then it's just the ratio between it and some factor that counts for the visibility. And 
this value gives you then the probability for a spectral jump within a time tau. And the nice thing here, you measure photocorrelation, so the time resolution is just limited by the time you can resolve the correlations. Maybe that's, depending on the detectors, a few hundred picoseconds or so. So you're not limited by measuring a whole spectrum. So you can translate this fluctuation directly in spectral jumps. And this gives you a possibility to measure, to measure sp spectral fluctuations in sub-microsecond states. Um, this is the, the measurement results. So we measure two curves here with this interferometer. The green one here is the autocorrelation function if there's no interferometer present, just a Hanbury bound twist configuration. And these blue dots correspond to the correlation after we put in this interferometer. And uh, we have to calculate this uh, jump probability. You can see there's a lot of error here because the signal is low, it's an anti-bunching, so typically you don't have two photons at a time, it's a single photon emitter, not too surprising. Uh, here you have better statistics, but the important thing is that you have this, this kind of kink here. And this dashed line is the typical time scale then of the spectral jumps. And you can see that you can resolve this very clearly. And if you take a look at the time scale, this gives you a jump probability every two microseconds in this uh, ND center that we have. So that's quite significantly, I think it stays kind of stable for two microseconds and then it jumps to another position. And then it jumps back, forth and back and forth. So we can see this uh, very fast spectral distribution here directly. Okay, we try to study a little more detail, what's the reason for it. Uh, this, for example, the, the jumps per microsecond determined in this way as a function of the excitation power. Uh, these are the measurements, the, the data has the green dots here, and you can see it has a kind of linear increase. So it's not a two photon process. This would have a kind of quadratic increase. And that means uh, it doesn't help you to reduce the excitation power, the jump probability in between the photons stays the same. If you excite less hard, uh, jumps do not occur so rapidly, but also photons do not come out so often. So I think that's just a linear dependency. Uh, first ingredient, what the reason is, uh, comes here. He, we measured this jump probability, or the jumps per microseconds per milliwatt pump power as a function of the excitation energy. And there you can see a kind of threshold behavior here in this case. If we have an excitation laser with an energy below about 2.3 EV, then the spectral jumps are reduced. And we speculate here that uh, obviously at this uh, energy level, 2.3 EV or so, we may ionate, ionize some local defect. And so that's the approach here. We uh, try to identify the origin of the spectral diffusion. It could come from the surface. It could come from intrinsic defects, but first of all, we have to understand and learn a little bit the physics of these defect centers, and this gives you some possibility here to take a look at ultrafast spectral diffusion and its dependence on excitation power, excitation energy, and so forth. Okay, um, so with respect to quantum uh, optics applications in terms of two photon interference, it's not so great news for using this nanocrystalline diamond. Uh, you can hope to enhance the photon collection efficiency with some structures. Maybe you can get 10 million photons per second or maybe a little bit more out of these structures. But that means that uh, even one and the same uh, ND center emits only maybe 10 or 20 photons coming one after each other, which are identical. This is good enough maybe for some demonstration experiments, but uh, it's not an ultra-stable source. Of course, you can extend this method to uh, ND centers in ultra-pure diamond, and that's at the moment what we are doing, to take a look at other diamond materials of higher quality, to see what the spectral jump, rate, jump rates are therein, and uh, see how this can be improved. It's also applicable to other materials, of course, colloidal quantum dots and so forth. You can study this as well, and it's also, it's also be done by others to learn about the spectral diffusion. So is did you look enough samples that it's always around 2.3 EV? I mean, no, that depends sure. from the sample to the sample. So that's another uh, problem, as mentioned. I think the shape is irregular, and also the uh, surface chemistry, the sample as it comes <coughs> on the table. So that would be another issue to go to a cryostat, to maybe heat it, to clean it, to see what comes from the surface and the forth. So these are some studies that we're performing now. So it's not a 
intrinsic typical defect that we know yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I come back to, to the last aspect of nano crystalline diamond and uh, that uh, leaves quantum optics a little bit and comes to using the uh, quantum properties of nano diamonds in a sense that quantum system often is very small, it's a small system. Okay, um, since you have a small system, a small quantum system, you can regard this also as the smallest possible optical probe that you can think of. The smallest optical probe would be a single atom or a single atom-like system. So a quantum dot, a molecule, or a defect center. And what can you measure with it? It's an optical probe. So you can measure the fluorescence as a function of position. You can measure the lifetime as a function of position. Or, as briefly introduced at the beginning, you can also measure the magnetic field locally as a function of the position. Uh, I showed that we attach these uh, NV centers to scanning probes. So I will show you uh, now the following the scanning probe approach. But uh, there has been some nice work recently, also here uh, by Ido. Uh, on scanning around single quantum probes, single quantum emitters. In this case, it's a colloidal quantum dot in a liquid system. I don't have to uh, tell you anything about this here. Uh, here it's an optical tweezer where a single NB center is trapped and also moved around. And for this experiment, you have some kind of a drosophila of this kind of experiments, which is a, a metal wire structure. So for, that's the first thing to probe to see the changing of the fluorescence of the lifetime if you scan a small emitter across a metallic wire and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so our approach, um, I've introduced it already. We have the possibility to attach uh, these nanocrystalline diamonds into scanning probes. And if we don't want to release it again, it's wise to stick the AFM tip in a glue on a polymer and then I think the approach it to the nanocrystal and then you can kind of uh, harden it so I think it's a solid uh, connection of the nano uh, diamond to the AFM tip. And then you can scan it around and uh, what you want to do is not only having kind of image of a layer, you scan it across a surface, you would like to have information in 3D, you know, also in Z direction. And uh, this is straightforward to obtain and uh, what we did, uh, again we have a single out NB center in a single nanocrystal. So we know that we attach a single quantum probe to the AFM tip. We glue it there. And then we use the AFM tip with a rather large oscillation amplitude, 100 nanometers or 200 nanometers and so forth. And then uh, we can collect the photons and correlate them to the absolute position of the cantilever. It could be close to the substrate or higher up. And also to the oscillation amplitude. So whenever we detect a photon, we just write down where is the cantilever in space. And in this way, by scanning, we can get a 3D map of the photon events where they occur. And once we collect the photon <coughs> events, also as a function of time, we can collect the absolute fluorescence and also the lifetime. So for each and every point in space, we can collect the fluorescence and also the lifetime. Um, this is some examples of the measurements. So again, as mentioned, we select out a, a single nanocrystal with a single MB center. So we make sure that we have a single emitter here. We glue it to the tip. And uh, that's also important to see. Uh, if you have these small nanocrystals, you have to make sure that they stay the same. In a sense, if you glue it, uh, it could change. I think the local environment changes. Before we have it lying flat, on, this, on the glass substrate, we glue it, we have some polymer glue around it, and obviously you can see that uh, the shape of this correlation function changed a little bit, and could be that we go here from a neutral defect to a charged defect, for example. So it's very important also to um, characterize the probe once it's fixed. Yeah? So it's, it's an important uh, feature of these nanocrystals. Okay, uh, as mentioned, um, if we are close to the substrate, we can see a specific lifetime. So this is a lifetime measured of the nanodiamond as is on the substrate. This is the lifetime of the nanodiamond attached to the AFM tip. So the tip itself also changes, already changes the lifetime. There's some higher index of refraction, maybe not too surprising. 
And this is now uh, the probe close to a metal a nanowire, and then also the lifetime is reduced. Um, stability is here. You can also see the decay is nicely modern exponential, so it's quite straightforward to fit a modern exponential to it and to measure lifetime directly. So these panels, we have some colored, colored pictures. So again, this Drosophila uh, type of silver wire that we have here lies here. It's just on a glass cover slide. And here we scan uh, the sample with the AFM tip further away. Here we scan the tip with the sample close to it, with the tip close to it. Close to it or further away means we just select out these events. We can select out any layer. Uh, so these are two extreme layers of the situation, the oscillation when the cantilever happens to be further away. This is for the situation when the cantilever happens to be closer to the surface. And you see already, I think, the colors here, they change. You can compare them absolutely with respect to each other. Uh, of course, also if you come close to the substrate, the lifetime reduces because you approach a material with a high index of refraction. So that also leads to a lifetime reduction. And uh, if you cross the wire, you can see it in close to metal wire, you have some additional quenching. Also, the lifetime decreases in this way. You can also see if you're further away, the, uh, you can see on the zoom in here, the uh, spatial uh, resolution is poorer if you're further away. Not too surprising, if you're closer, you have a better a spatial resolution. And in principle, the spatial resolution is only limited by the extension of the NV center and how close you can bring it to the structure. Um, these are some other wires across each other. Again, you can take different slices. So once you made the scan in 3D, you can also make a three-dimensional plot of the local density of state. You can see one figure here. Um, can you see this? I think you have kind of additional line here next to the wire. And that's a typical artifact that you have in, in scanning probes. Because you always have to gather, I think, you scan the probe, and then you measure the topography at the same time. And if you see a change in the optical signal, this can be due only to the topography, yeah, because you're changing the topography. However, if we uh, record the absolute position of the AFM tip, we can recalculate the image and getting rid of these uh, topography images. And this is shown on the next slide. So as mentioned, we know, I think, for each and every position where the cantilever actually is. We know the absolute position from the stabilization circuit, and we know the oscillation amplitude. And so we can recollect that the tip actually follows the topography. And this is done here, and this is why we have data yeah, of the oscillation yeah, going I think, across the wire. So if you take a look at all these pixels here, yeah, they are topography free. So they don't have topography errors. So you can see the pure optical signal. And this you can obtain this information in 3D. This is just a nice view of how the geometry looks like. Now you can calculate here the kind of true local density of state free from uh, topography artifacts, which we think is also important. Um, then, once you do this, you can also calculate the gradient of the local density of state. Yeah, why is this interesting? Uh, it could be interesting because recently it has been shown uh, oops, has been shown uh, has been shown in this paper that uh, the gradients or how is the, the change of the lifetime if you go away from the sample that gives you some information about the nature of coupling. Here in this paper it was from the Stuttgart group, they saw that for example the first uh, energy transfer depends on the dimensionality. You have a di different exponential in the uh, approach curve if you go away. So the gradient can also give you some information about the nature of the coupling. And this is obviously right away available in the scanning probe. Another issue, here we always have a topography. Now we know just by looking at the topography that we have a silver wire there. But you can also envision that you have a structure without a topography. Maybe you have just a flat structure and buried below the surface, you may have some metal structures or quantum dot or something. And uh, you can see if you hadn't known that, uh, oops, if you hadn't known that there was a, a wire here, if you just had to look at this colored area, you can still see that the gradient points at a specific location. So you think about also taking a look at some buried structures to learn something that's not observable in topography. We didn't have a clever idea how to make a topography-free 
a probe so far. It's not so easy to make a completely topography free probe. So that's something we're working on at the moment. Okay, you can make nice images. Maybe that's not so hard to see. So my student Andreas may try to make a three-dimensional image. So I think if everything is filled with color, you don't see anything anymore. Maybe you should try to rotate something. Uh, this is again a scan of these crossed wires and uh, the geometry is a little bit like this. I think, I hope you can see this. So we, we just show, I think, two scans in this direction, two scans in this direction. So this corresponds to this direction, and this direction. So you can see the topography and on top of it, you can see the kind of image points where we measure the uh, kind of lifetime of the emitter. But you can envision that this could give a 3D plot. Okay, um, yeah, that's that's where we are. So we, we try to extend this a little bit and see how good uh, this can be used to, to study topography-free um, probes and also to learn about the interaction. So actually what changes the local density of state and how, how does it depend on the distance to the, to the emitters and so forth. Okay, everything uh, has also been convoluted with the orientation of the dipole. So there's a lot of data, I think, in these uh, scanning probe measurements that you can obtain in this way. Okay, um, for an outlook, I think I talked a lot about a lot of things. So I just would like to close here and thank my group in particular, um, Andreas here, uh, Andreas Schell, and Yannick Wolters, who uh, performed this basically these diamond measurements. And I thank uh, our funding agency, and I thank also you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.